Peggy, what's happening? Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm good. I'm just roasting like most of the rest of the country, probably not Chicago, but um, it's hot everywhere else. We've been dodging storms yeah. the last couple of yeah, days. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I've but, heard that. But uh, the uh, the temperature's been pretty moderate. It's been pretty good and where we are. Tommy, the Bears dodged a storm yeah, last they night did. by signing their first two. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> there was never any storm coming. I know. No. I told you guys that last week. Yeah, I told you it was irrelevant. Yeah, that irrelevant. was a, it, that, That's kind of one of those manufactured angst stories yeah. because yeah. there's nothing to yeah. talk about until training camp begins, right, Mike? So you, you know what, those of us who are old enough, Peggy's not quite there either, where you, there used to be, you could say to, you could look at a producer or an editor and say, not everything's a big deal. <laughs> no one does that anymore. Everybody wants to make something a big deal. So their show or their podcast or their segment resonates. It doesn't. It was no, it was, it didn't matter. It was irrelevant. But with that said, to have them in the fold and, and training camp starting on Saturday has to give you maybe a little extra gas in the tank this year versus maybe other training camps because of the, the optimism that exists with this team. Well, Tommy, I'm gassed up. It had nothing to do with the signing because I knew the signing was coming. Right. So, I'm, no, I'm, I'm gassed up anyway. I, you know, my wife has threatened to leave the house like Labor Day weekend. and not, She said, oh, my God. Is this going to be like 2016? I said, yes, hopefully. It won't end with that result. We're too early for that. I said, but yes, are you asking if my obsessive nature will come through? Yes, it will start in about three weeks, and you may as well get used to it. What, what are your expectations from Caleb Williams? Like, What, what will you be happy with, Michael? Um, you know, Peggy, I think it depends on where he starts. God help us if he starts like three and one. I just want to get better. You know, I, I think we made reference to this a little bit last week, and I go back to, you know, being a tiny little kid when Sayers and Buckets were drafted, and they were like 0-4 or something, and then they, you know, ran off 9 out of 10 wins and still didn't make the playoffs. I want, I want to see that kind of progress. Give me that late-season surge that says they're getting better. I'm going to try not to tie it to the playoffs and expectations and all that. I'm going to try not to. Doesn't mean I'm not going to get carried away like the rest of the metropolis. But let me see improvement. Let me see improvement over the course of the segments of the season. And, and I've said this a bunch now. I'm starting to bore myself with re repeating it over and over again, Mike. But um, you, traded, you, you, you traded Justin Fields away. You decided not to move forward with him. You could have moved forward with him, taken that pick, and traded it for the haul. They decided not yeah. to. And I agreed with their decision. With that in yeah. mind, though, you draft Caleb first overall. You bring in a new offensive coordinator. Your infrastructure is infinitely better than it ever was with Justin Fields. I said to Peg, if we get to the second half of the season, my expectation level is, is that the quarterback play is going to be significantly different than what we've seen the last couple of years. And if it isn't, because of the reasons I just mentioned, I'm going to be a little bit more than slightly upset i'm going to be disappointed well tommy i'm going to take a cue for i'm standing in line behind you on this because your your expectations your analysis are different than the rest of us dopes and you're looking at this you know yes as a guy who used to wear that jersey and who lives in this lives in chicago and wants to do them do well but you also your your perspective is colored by actual expertise as opposed to you know and mike let me just of a, let me add this real quick to i don't mean to interrupt you but but when i say that right. when i say that i'm not attaching numbers to it i'm not saying he has right, to throw right, for four thousand right. yards and 30 touchdowns what i'm telling you right. is is my eyes have to tell me with how he uh, reads and goes through his progressions how he manages the pocket how the ball comes out how he does all of that that he needs to do if it's not better than what we've seen, I'm going to be upset because they made all of the decisions that they made because they believe this kid can get yes. them somewhere else. Every, everybody's butt's on the line here. Yeah. And, Tommy, listen, I defer, again, I'm repeating myself, I defer to two specific people, you and Richard Dent. The, 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 the former Bears I probably talked to the most, listened to the most, 
have been educated by the most, who have the most reasonable set of expectations and um, abilities to judge these situations. I love listening to you guys. That's why I apologize in advance for all the texts you're going to get over the next, you know, eight months. Um, and I know I won't be the only one who, who's doing that, who's overloading you guys. But I do, I do. And if I'm out here in Arizona where I am now, and I run into a certain number number nine who was in the Super Bowl and won, I, then I, I attach him to that list, too, of people I can say, hey, what am I seeing here? What am I supposed to see? What do you see? What do you expect? Because you guys are the experts. So I defer to you um, my expectations you know, I mean, you know, you know, some Sundays I'm out of line, and you usually <laughs> fairly quickly put me back in line. You put me and Sylvie back in line. God help you. You get, you need a whip and a chair to um, control both of us on a lot of Sunday evenings. So we all we all have expectations, and you know, yours are at the top one tenth of one percent. Look, mine are in the top one percent because I've covered enough people. Great coaches, great players to know to listen to. I know to listen to Jim McMahon. I know to listen to Steve Young. I know to listen to you and Richard. And there are, and there are others, there are people that I go to and say, am I being reasonable? And that will inform my judgment. So I'm not starting out of control, Tommy. I'm not. Right. And I'm not attaching it to numbers, at least not now. And so I want to see improvement. I'm going to go back to something else. I know you and Sylvia always roll your eyes, Peggy. Forgive me. But I, I covered Joe Gibbs' first team with the Washington Redskins, they were then. And they had like four Hall of Famers. You know, John Riggins, Daryl Green, Art Monk, and I'm missing somebody, Russ Grimm. Four Hall of Famers. And so that first team went 0-5. 0-5. And, and they wound up eight and eight. And then the next season they were like in the Super Bowl. So that even that trajectory may be too much, but I, I have an idea of what it looks like when you're developing players who are all youngsters, but they, except for Riggins and they wind up in the hall of fame, you know, 10 and 12 and 15 years later, I have some sense of what that looks like and great coaching to get them there. Fair. Totally fair. Uh, so uh, we won't put numbers on expectations, but there is an expectation that it will look different, right? And that this is step one towards hopefully a stretch of time that we can all be proud of and, and, and collectively say, hey, look, this team is, is becoming a contender. Yeah, yes, yes. And there are things, you know, there's, underperformance, their trades, there's free agency, there's the business of I don't want to pay him that much. There is look, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a child of a period with Chicago sports where I lived through at the first end, Gail Sayers and Dick Buck is having their knees ruined. Oh yeah. And then Derek Rose. So so I am scarred by that, all of that. Um, even to some extent, Jerry Sloan, who was a great player and is a Hall of Famer, but did not max. I mean, Chicago, Chicago, I would argue, has suffered more through knee injuries. I didn't even mention because it was such a short stint, Lamar, not Lamar, uh, um, Ball. Um, Lonzo Ball? I, I suffered through uh, Lonzo Ball. I've suffered through that, guys, and – you know, these things happen. They derail they derail Hall of Fame careers. If they don't derail them, they lessen them. Because I just named three Hall of Famers whose careers were lessened, without question. And these things happen. And they don't happen just in Chicago. I mean, you know, um, they happen in other cities. My God, Portland's had a bunch of them with just one franchise. But I'm hoping that they can be healthy enough at the positions that are most important in the careers that are most important to let's see it let's see if it can develop and flower fully yeah so that's what i'm hoping for do you have confidence in in matt eberflus's staff that they are going to 
coach up this offensive line and defensive line. Eric Washington, the new D-line, or the defensive coordinator, uh, Shane Waldron, and his new offensive line staff. I mean, the two biggest question marks with this team are in the trenches, where we're all like, that's where you're supposed to start. Yeah. yeah. And, Peggy, that, that has to be the first question that you just posted is about those, even before Caleb, is about both those lines. But in my case, look, I'm, I'm, I have a different take on confidence. It's the most overused word in the culture. You get confidence from repeated successes. Mm. or at the very least, repeated efforts. Um, people, you know, in some, Peggy, you play a lot of golf. People will say when you're standing over a, uh, uh, you're standing at the first tee over a ball and you've got a drive in your hand, swing it with confidence. Well, why, why am I going to do that? If the last seven I've duck hooked, why am I going to swing it with confidence? Yeah. I'm going to swing it with confidence if I've had repeated successes. So, and that starts in practice. It does. I have more confidence if it's going straight on the range. So what are the Bears going to do in camp and in practices and in preseason games and in the first couple of games? So the confidence, I don't have any confidence in anybody. The confi- I have confidence in D.J. Moore and Ke- the kids Keenan in San Allen. Diego because I've seen them do it. Keenan Allen. Otherwise, no, I don't have confidence in anybody. you got to earn that. There's no extra credit. This is not fourth grade. Right. I, you know, I'm not I'm not giving people, you know, gumdrops and, and orange drinks. Well, I think I, I'm not. You got to you got to show me. So do I have confidence in that staff? No, I may have it in short order. But again, you posed the most important question. Like, where are those two units and where are they going to be by, say, how not even Halloween, Columbus Day? Before, yeah. before they hit the division, well, I, yeah, listen, the divi- I think all the division I, 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 yes, I, I, on the Peggy, schedule, yes. you, I, ha- you have to know yeah. that. I think that, you know, yeah. it's kind of a common theme here, as we've talked about the upcoming season, is, is that the concern at the line of scrimmage on both sides of the football is legit for me. And if you don't, I, but I do believe that there is an opportunity for both sides of the ball to be better than we anticipate if A, Maybe they, they sign a pass rusher or trade for one. Or B, some of the yeah. pieces on the offensive line start to gel and play better and more available. If that's the case, we'll see real growth. But without that happening, again, as I say, my expectation for the quarterback is that the quarterback play is significantly better than it was at, at, at any point in the last couple of years. At this point, they're still the third best team in their division until they prove otherwise. And a lot yeah, of a lot of that will be determined by how they develop on the offensive and defensive line because if they remain status quo, you're not getting past the Packers or the Detroit Lions until you get better in the but trenches. Tom, well, and- but that's every team every year. Yes. That's every team every year. Everybody's, you know, we're looking at development every team every, every season. I mean, there's no season where that's not the case. So I'm going to go back to – a Bears team is not as far back. I'm going to go halfway far as far. No, Richard did report at the camp. What did anybody expect of Richard being drafted in the eighth round? Peggy, you and I were newbies, but we were around for that. Yeah. You were, you were probably going to some beginning of your camp life then. Nobody thought that of Richard. People didn't have Richard in a gold jacket. People didn't have Wilbur Marshall ending ball carriers' careers on other teams even though he was the first-round draft pick out of Florida. What was he, like 11th or something? People didn't have Otis doing – they didn't. They didn't have Gary Fensick. Talk about – They didn't even have Gary Fensick oh as a, as a safety right. in the NFL. That's right. Fensick wasn't – but we knew Doug Plank was on the latter stages of a career in which he could literally knock an iron horse down. But nobody knew Fensick was going to pair with him at that level for those two years before Fensick, I mean, before Plank had to go and they still carry on. Yeah. And so, yes, development, those coaches, that coaching staff, and I don't just mean Mike and Buddy, the position coaches, and Tommy, I'm sure you got to know some of them because they were still around, some of them when you played. That staff, how great was that staff? Oh, it was fantastic. I, I mean, I think it, ever, it all goes hand in hand. You've, you've got to identify the talent, so the talent's got to exist. Then you've got to develop the talent. 
And it yep. really goes hand in hand. If you've got really talented players, they will more than likely be developed by good coaches. Sometimes, and you know, just that we don't believe that. I didn't believe that Justin Fields was ever coached in a way that would get the best out of him that would suggest that to, to more people, and, and particularly the people in Hallis Hall, that you keep him and do something else with the pick. I, I, that he wasn't developed and coached in that way. So we have to think that that's going to happen this time around. Well, but, this, again, I don't extend confidence until I see some This is why I've said outside of the quarterback, Mike, I can make a great case for Shane Waldron, their offensive coordinator, for being the second most important person in the building. Yes, yes, agreed, agreed, agreed. I mean, we, we've seen that around the league. It, look, at, look at all the people. I go back to my experience because I live in Washington primarily. Look at all the people from that staff that became successful yeah. as head coaches. In, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles. I mean, people who have been to Super Bowls and won them in the case of the, of the Rams, those were assistant coaches who were in their building they let go and didn't have confidence in. you got to get that right, too. So, Tommy, yes. Yes. Hey, he, uh, he is, his importance in that building is undeniable. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, to segue away from football, football for a bit, do you have any, you know, buzz for the All Star Game tonight? No, I'm not even going to watch it. I'll probably <laughs> watch the um, WNBA game, Aces and Sun. I'm serious. All the All Star Games are off my radar. The Pro Bowl was so bad they stopped playing it. The NBA All Star Game is so bad they need to stop playing it, at least in that format. Um, baseball's the NHL just winds up being 12 to 11, and I, you know, I'm a Definitely a, a late-season, you know, hockey fan, for sure. I don't watch as much as I watch the NBA. But and Major League Baseball has the best, most viable all-star game, but I still don't care about it anymore. Yeah. I, used to, I used to live on it. So, no, I'm going to watch the WNBA tonight. Um, and I'm trying to look at the Bulls in the Summer League, and I'm, I'm trying not to be in despair over not drafting Terrence Shannon Jr. Well, but, but sure. the, the kid, Bazellus... Yeah, and, and he good. It, yeah, it, I mean he's he's look good. Yeah, and did they get this one right? Yeah. Possibly. Well, I mean, could they have been in a position if they, you know, done some trading before the deadline to have them both? Well, that's you know, I, couldn't they have gotten Terrence Shannon Jr. and Metellus? I mean, couldn't they? I mean, this is where, and I don't know. Look, it's too early to like pronounce anything, but you know how many I, I'm a broken record on with you guys every week saying. That league is particularly about luck in the draft, skill, luck, and development. Because mm -hmm. you can find and develop great players at any level of the draft, including early, including the second round. So, but man, when you see Terrence Shannon Jr. go for like 25 and 7 in a Minneapolis lineup, oh, you're like, oh, no. Could we have taken two locals? Is that going to be pump the brakes on that in a few weeks or a couple of months? I don't know, but I'm just saying right now I'm sitting there watching the summer league going, eh. Hey, hey, uh, to baseball again real quick, not the all-star game, but your favorite baseball team on the north side took five of their last, yeah. won five of their last seven. They swept the Orioles yeah. and took two of yeah. four, split with St. Louis split. in St. Louis. Yeah. Um, listen, they're at the bottom of the division. They're eight and a half back, but they're only yeah. three or three and a half out of the wild card. Are you given this team yeah. that showed a little bit of spark towards the end of this part of the season and has had a very, very, very good starting rotation? Are you giving them any chance in the second half? Not really. I'd like to see them become sellers. I want to see them come up with some pitching. I mean, everybody, you look at every team – even the real contenders, Cleveland, the Yankees, the Dodgers, they're all collapsing. They're pitching. Nobody has enough depth. Nobody knows what to do about it. Um, the Cubs, I want the starters. I don't want to sell any of them. But if you can tell me that, that, that a veteran player goes to somebody who can send me a young closer, you're not ready for Chapman. It's not 2016. But if you can give me a young closer or two, a couple of arms out of the bullpen that I can buy now to help me next season, I, I think I'd be in favor of that. I don't want to get – look, if they, if they come out of the gate and they win six out of eight, then maybe I'd change my mind. Um, but 
the Orioles, speaking of teams, contenders limping in, they limped in losing those, you know, getting swept by the Cubbies. And good for the Cubs that they that they took advantage of that. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to overstate it. No, do I have any confidence in the Cubs doing that? I want to see if the starting pitching can hold up and be the starting pitching. If they lose a bunch of more one run games and blow leads, then that tells me the way we need to go is a bullpen with some depth in it that we can count on going into next season. Well, Michael, the new the newest uh, thing that they are going to do, the newest challenge at the uh, MLB All Star Game these days, is going to be sing the anthem drunk. That that's oh. going to be the new. I know that was so nasty. She has was, come out and apologized and said she is seeking yeah, help. So she she has that. acknowledged that the there is an issue and hopefully she she finds it's too it. bad. She's a talented young woman, yes. four Grammy nominations. Berkeley School of Music. I mean, yes. this is a different yeah. talented, learned, learned young woman. And when I heard, I didn't, I didn't hear it until I watched it on video today. And my first thought was, oh my goodness, there's some slurring of words. And I didn't really know that much. I didn't know the details because I didn't watch it live. It is a really. So you just I, hope. I, I, I I can't sing. I can, I, I have no musical talent at all. It seems like it'd be a very, not only is it the, the magnitude of singing in front of a lot of people, which she has done yeah. because she's, you know, been yeah, an accomplished artist for quite some time. Yeah. I, is it, is it the national anthem a pretty hard yes. song one of the to sing? Songs, yes. yes. One of the hardest songs. And people who sing any number, a variety of anthems, by the way, professional singers, I know because I've asked. And I do have a little musical background, believe me. I was getting off the L at State and Adams for like nine years of my life going to Lion and Healy taking music lessons. Wow. So there was a previous life. There was a previous life. Never knew me. that. And, yeah, I try to keep that quiet because you couldn't <laughs> prove it by me now. And wait, wait, instrument the, the, or singing? The, the, instrument or singing? Instrument, instrument, not singing. What'd you play? And the Star Spangled Banner is maybe the most difficult of the, the national anthems if you mm. ask professional singers. Yeah. And I have. And so it's hard anyway. But if you hear, if you don't know any better, and you just hear her voice, just her voice, the tenor and the pit, you're like, okay, she can sing. Now, whatever else happens, happens for a reason. But it's not because she can't get this done. Right. Yeah. It was too bad. that, that That's what everyone ended up talking about. Yeah. You it was know, and that was it. I still want to know what instrument you played. Uh, keyboard, specifically organ. I would, I have gone to... Wrigley Field and sat in the organ booth there with Bruce and Judy Miles. And Bruce was the Cubs organist for a long time, a while. Let me not say a long time, a while. And he, he and his wife, Judy, Judy first, and then Bruce, they were my music teachers for years. For, from the time I was nine, maybe nine years old until wow. I went to Northwestern at 17. Wow. For the first half of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, all I wanted to do, Nancy Faust was one of my idols because I would go to Comiskey. And one time I had the nerve to walk over and just stare and just say, excuse me, can I like introduce myself? When Nancy Faust was legendary, she might have been the first woman playing regularly for any major league team. Seems to me that she was when she was at Comiskey Park when I was a kid. And I don't know if any of the people I mentioned are still with us. I hope so. But, yeah, so I had – no, I, I actually could – I was never as talented as my brother. Don, and you'll love this, Tommy, Don was the reason my parents put us in music and the older brother had to go along because you don't want to embarrass him. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was that kid. And Don was the talent. Don was the one who played in the little garage band with a guy named Daryl Jones, Daryl Munch Jones, who has since for the last 20 years been the basis for something called the Rolling Stones. Wow. Gosh. So when they were in town last week, two weeks ago, I was there. I didn't go to, I didn't go to Soldier Field. But, you know, I, we te I teased Daryl. I've seen him in London. And people in London, people literally fall out. They faint when they see him. And it's just like, oh, my God, I grew up with this kid. He's, the, he's in the Rolling Stones. <laughs> And so he and Don had talent, and him he much more than Don. But Don much more than me, and both of them, you know, light years more than me. Wow.
That's awesome. That is really You learn cool. something new every time really you have a cool. conversation with Michael Wilbon. Thank you for sharing Wilbon. that. Yeah. <laughs> really cool. I come out of the left field occasionally. And you never know what you're going to get. Very nice. Hey, stay cool out there in the desert, will you? I will. I will. Listen, if I was in D.C., it's the same thing. They're both like 101 today here in, in Carefree, Arizona, where I am. It's more. It's, it's, I guess it's Carefree. It's 102 here, 101 in D.C., so what difference does it Yeah, well, it's a dry heat in um, Arizona, right? Isn't that what everyone it, says? It, hey, listen, I know the difference because I live in 90% humidity and I live in 5% humidity. And the only people who don't know the difference are people who don't experience both. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, keep so I'm going to take this every time. Yeah, I was going to say, keep it cool. Thanks for uh, the conversation, Mike, as always. We appreciate it. All right, it. you guys. Thank you. All right, be good.